Hello everyone. Hope everybody's doing well today. So it's fall-ish in Kansas and the weather has turned and the light has turned and it just feels like we're headed towards a beautiful fall because we've had an incredible summer. And it is time to shift our thinking from summer sewing to fall sewing. And to, so today we're talking about denim and jackets and some fun details. And I want to introduce again, Kathy Davis, Hello. who has been by my side for a month and a half. <laughs> no, this is a little joke around here. Um, okay, so when did you, what was the year you came on board? Probably 90, 1999. 1999. In 1999, I had a fabric store called Threadwear, a retail fabric store in Topeka. And we had a pattern collection then, and we had a pattern called the tie coat. And one day, this is long before internet and ordering over the internet and all of that, the phone started to ring off the wall, ordering tie coats. And we just couldn't figure out what was going on. And we had so many phone calls that I called Kathy Davis, who was my best and number one customer at the time, and I said, can you come in and answer the phone for a few days? <laughs> and she came in and never left. <laughs> and she lost her best customer. And I lost my best customer. <laughs> but we, as it turned out, uh, there was a woman by the name of Eunice Farmer. Eunice Farmer of Eunice Farmer Fabrics in St. Louis, who also wrote a syndicated column weekly. And she had written about the tie coat. Thus, all the surge in orders from all over the country, the world, whatever. So you came, and I discovered that Kathy, who is the finest sewer I've ever known in my life, in the world, <laughs> it's true, had other talents as well, and became our pattern developer. And so for how many years? Since 99, what is that? 20, 20 years, 19 years, something like that. Uh, Kathy was here in the studio developing our patterns, choosing designs, making the designs up, developing the, um, the written materials. She worked closely with Erin on the visuals, the illustrations, all of that, fabrications. Um, Kathy has this knack of being able to combine fabrics really in a really interesting way. And she's definitely a fashionista following great designers, designers that no one can afford that I know, <laughs> at least. And she will find a picture on, I don't know, what, what, what are your sources? Pinterest, Etsy, Pen. eBay, fashion magazines? Yeah, just things like that that come up on the internet, that come up on your phone. There's also, um, there's another one that comes in, an international one that will show the recent runway shows, although that's kind of dwindled down because no one's doing actual runway, but virtual. So just kind of, I can look on my phone every day and find something that I think, oh, that's an, you know, that sparks maybe another idea that, you know, I didn't see, have seen before, so. Yeah, it, it mm -hmm. can be a color, it can be a fabric combination, it can be a technique. Sometimes what you produce has nothing to do with the starting point, no. <laughs> but at least it sparked something. And we have customers all the time who call, email, come in, who hand us a picture and say, I want to do something sort of kind of like this. And Kathy was always so good at uh, combining the fabrics and helping people through those projects and working out some of the details and the engineering of things. So Kathy proceeded to work here. She did retire a couple of years ago, much to my chagrin. I'll never forget that moment when you came in and she said, I'm retiring, and I, I think I went home that day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was very sad, but at any rate. Uh, but we've continued a working relationship, and now actually there are some facets of her retirement that have been really beneficial because she now has the time to be really creative and bring things, ideas to us all the time, garments that she's made, photos of things, uh, and so we've been able to incorporate many of her ideas even today that she's working on at home. So it's quite inspirational to work 
alongside Kathy. So welcome again. Well, thank you. And what a glowing description. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, we've been together a long time. We've traveled together. <laughs> we would go into the great boutiques around the world. Around the world, it makes me think we've been around the world two or three times. <laughs> <laughs> In two countries. In two countries, <laughs> but you know, whatever. Uh, but we like to shop together. I don't really like to shop at home. I don't think you really do either, but I do like to, when I say shop, I don't mean necessarily buy, but go in and look and feel and touch the great garments that we see in these great boutiques. And the more expensive, the better. Those are the ones we really want to look at and study. So it's really fun. We've had a good time doing that over the years. So we are going to talk about denim today. And I, I, you all know I love books. And I have a library of books. And I went to the basement today to my library, unfortunately it is in the basement, and found this book called Blue Jean. And this was written in 2002, and it's mostly a book of photography of great denim fashions and famous people. But I loved this little intro about denim. So during the gold rush of Nevada, uh, people used to wear Levi's, in the 1880s, 1885, and they called them denim waist overalls, actually, and they cost a dollar twenty-five, brand new. Well, in 1998, Levi Strauss came upon this stash of junk. They called it miner's junk, and so they bought that same garment back that used to cost a dollar twenty-five that they had produced. They bought it back at auction for forty-six thousand five hundred and thirty-two dollars. And that's 10 years ago from this book, so I don't really know. But I, I, I like this. What is extraordinary about the sale is not that the artifact, created almost 30 years before the first Model T Ford, lived the life of a miner or that it outlasted then 23 American presidents and still survived almost totally intact. What makes the story remarkable as that this humble piece of denim remains instantly recognizable as work pants, leisure wear, even as high fashion to the world in which it reemerged 120 years later. So I think we've gone through periods of time when we think that denim is sort of out. But really, it is not. It's just an evolution of how we're wearing it, how we're using it, but not very much in how it's made. The original denim was actually made uh, in Nimes, France. And it was called Serge de Nimes. And I, that was in the 1700s, actually. But it's generally a dyed fabric, blue, traditionally, with a white filling. So when you see denim, true denim, it's two colors, one color on the surface and generally a whitish color on the reverse side. So, you know, I'm a book junkie, but there we go. <laughs> All right. So Kathy and I happen to really love the Chicago jacket. You have one on in what? Um, I think it's a, a, a double silk is what I think it is. It's um, something that came, it was originally a put away unfinished project, which I really don't have very many, but I'd probably started it 20 years ago and it was to be one of those big Miyake wind coats. And when I revisited it last year, I thought, you know, that's just like making a boat cover. <laughs> and so I thought, what can I do with that? And cut it up and save everything. And the Chicago jacket to me is a fun thing that you can just, a great garment you can throw on. The construction is not anything like people don't want to do a tailored, all the tailoring, um, pockets that you love, great fit. So I have about four Chicago jackets now, and so I really like to add those to the wardrobe. So, And you have it on with Picasso pants yes. and an E.T. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So I have on a Chicago jacket in a totally different kind of fabric, whereas Kathy has done some piecing on hers with the reverse side. Your fabric technically is a mat -lise, I think. Oh, is it? Good. <laughs> Well, that's what I learned at K-State in 1969, well, you know more than I do. so there you go, uh, <laughs> in textile class. Um, but mine is just a simple cotton from Japan, and it looks like I've pieced it, but these, this is a print. You made this, actually, and 
it, it was uh, one of those kinds of prints where the design it was really spaced out. Could have been one of those fabrics where you say, oh, I don't know how to work with this. These, these designs are hit and miss and all over. But I think you just kind of cut it out. And then you ran out of fabric on the sleeves. And so this is a different <laughs> fabric for the sleeves. Did you remember any of this? No. <laughs> it's fun to see that yeah. again. So I'm wearing it with a simple t-shirt that I bought. And I have on Picasso pants as well. So my Picasso pants are the black cotton and lycra that I talk about all the time. And Kathy's are her black lightweight ponte knit. So we've talked about the fact that these Picasso pants are just universally great with almost anything. And you can make them in a woven or a knit. So we have some Chicago jackets to show you today that have had some work done on them. So let's talk about yours first. So this is Kathy's Chicago jacket. Um, this is from actually a lightweight denim, a rather embossed. It has a few little areas of, of uh, a different weave in it. But um, I decided to get out all of my, my tub of kimono fabrics that have been in the fabric stash since 1997. And in fact, at one time we belonged to a kimono swatch club of the month. And it was all kimono, and it was wonderful. But every month you got a package about like this of kimono fabric. And I mean, they're beautiful. They're all folded, cleaned, cut right, and rather coordinating, too. So I'm really glad the lady retired because I think my I have probably 70 packages <laughs> of the wonderful kimono. So I decided I would get them out since I'm in retirement. And um, you see all the new things on the rack today with a lot of raw edge, a lot of raveling, and honestly, the high-end stuff, it took me a long time to get used to the raw edge in garments. But um, now I've become comfortable with it. So these were pieced on, they're all raw edge pieces that I just cut and put on. and. Um, I found maybe about 10 to 20 coordinating pieces. You know, I kind of started with a package like this, so it was easy and added. But then um, I sorted down to maybe only using 10. And the start of the jacket, you can really overthink this. The thing is to just slap them on and not worry about it. If you don't like the way it looks, walk away from it <laughs> and come back later. And it always looks a little different. But so on this was fairly easy because I had a piece. I only did half of the back. And I wanted things to run vertically at first. So uh, this was probably the first one that went down. And then this one went down in here. and then. You just cut and experiment. I didn't plan any of it. You'll see it's quite different than Linda's um, execution of her jacket. But, um, and so I just laid it on, kind of chalked out here of the outline, took it to the pressing board, and used fusy web and just held it down enough for me to sew it. Now the stitching on this is all just a channel stitch. And after the channel stitch, maybe sometimes I went around each piece to give it a little more security of raveling, but just a presser foot away channel stitching. Now you're doing this on the pieces before you're assembling the jacket. I did. The first I did on, actually I sewed it on paper. Not really. really. What do you mean? Um, because I didn't know how to, <laughs> when I laid it on here, um, I had a piece of paper under it and I thought, now how am I going to pick this all up oh. and take it to the pressing board and get it fusy webbed. So I did it on paper the first time. And then I stitched it ar around the edges, around here, pulled the paper off, and then channel stitched it on. Well, after a while I thought, 
I don't really need that paper under there because the other pieces were going to be a smaller area. So I ended up just laying it out if I couldn't remember how it was pieced by the time I got to the pressing table to fuse it, I took a picture. And so then I just figured out which ones are on the, the base of it. And so I'll pro I put this down first. And then, you know, as then I you started stacking them. Stacking them. Well, I didn't particularly trim under where they uh, overlapped. Right. You left the layers, the full layers. I did, and you know, it did add some body to it, some stiffness to it. But um, this was a fairly soft denim -y fabric, so it could use a little bit of structure for this garment. So that was the first thing, and so to take it around, then I did the sleeve. And I, would, I laid the sleeve on there to kind of figure out which pieces will go transfer in kind of a little bit of a continuous way and did the sleeve. And then I came around to do this front. But I didn't want to do the whole design asymmetrical. So to me, I had a lot of fabric over here building up. And so when I went to the other side, I just did the bottom of this, took it across the side seam just a little, and then up here. Yeah, it's a nice balance. Okay. So you have some lights and darks, and yet there's a tonal uh, continuity to it. But the idea of a concentration here and a concentration here, then this one with less over here, that, that whole uh, arrangement is really balanced, in my opinion. And I think it's important to maybe throw in one piece, one color that's a little bit unexpected, mm -hmm. and maybe it would be the light color here. Right. But, you know, I think it'd look pretty if you do it all in subtle muted shades also, right. but anyway. So, so it does ravel if you object to it. You can turn things under, but that would be really um, <laughs> quite an extensive job. So just carry, if you don't like it, carry a little portable nail scissors. <laughs> Well, the other thing and you could do, strings. and I have done this, when a fabric is terrifically ravelly and you're worried that it's going to ravel out next to the stitching, is I have cut the pieces on the bias. Oh, yeah. If the design works to, in your favor. And then those edges are, are just going to soften and not really fray out. So that's yeah, another that possibility. Is, right. So if you were doing this today and you did not have this stash of ah kimono fabrics, where would you go to find the the kimono pieces, the scraps, the indigo pieces, whatever? Well, those, I mean, that source has kind of dwindled down a little bit. I mean, we used to pick them all up when we did trade shows, and mm -hmm. there would be other vendors there, which, so it was fun to do that. Um, actually, if you would Google kimono pieces, kimono scraps, I don't really want to call them scraps because you don't know what you get, but uh, some came up on Etsy. And uh, some were in silk, some were in cottons, which would be useful for the one Linda will talk about later. But it looked like a fairly um, good selection on there. Right. And so just Google it. You'll, you will find not only Etsy, but you'll find a few other sources And don't forget also. about your storage closet or your basement where you have some silk blouses that you're not wearing anymore, some ties that your husband is not or partner is not wearing anymore. Or silk scarves. Silk that you scarves. Don't. They don't you, even have you to You probably be silk. have fabric <laughs> yeah. somewhere that you might be willing to cut up and use. So you don't necessarily have to buy anything to do this. You you've got more than you probably realize. Right. So all right. Um, so you used regular thread, a regular stitch, uh, cotton thread for your channel stitching, and you just used the presser foot width for your tra channel stitching. So there was there's nothing particularly uh, fancy about the stitching. No, but the fusy web was the, a, to hold it down first. A great help. And a walking foot. Yes. She, Kathy sews with a foff that has a built-in even feed foot, and so she engages it all the time, as, as do I, sewing on a Bernina with an uh, mm -hmm. even feed feature. 
you, I can't sew without that anymore, I, and I it, it prevents the crawling and creeping of those fabrics on the top surface of that fabric. Both Kathy and I have really been investigating a lot of hand stitch embellishments lately, and I, in particular, and I think you're into it too, Clara Wellesley Smith is a, an artist in the UK, north of London, who has written this book called Slow Stitches. And there are a lot of designs in here that you could use either for hand stitching or machine stitching that if you don't want to do channel stitching, you could use some inspiration from this to apply to stitching your pieces onto the base. And if you're kind of stuck in terms of design, there are lots of resources, including lots of really great African designs. There's a book called African Canvas. There's a, a village, Mbele, I'm probably, Nimbele, I'm probably saying that incorrectly. But there are lots of villages in Africa whose uh, women are painting buildings. But you could take a picture like this, let's say, a little mosaic sort of affair and figure out sort of the proportion and relationships of fabrics if you're a little bit stuck on how to place things. So take a look at your library or online or whatever. I think sometimes we get too cautious about our design. We're afraid, oh my gosh, somebody's going to look at that and think, what the heck did you do? Just right. let it go. Right. I mean, years ago, this would not appeal to me. Today, it does. Yeah. Well, what I thought was interesting about this jacket was, are you sort of done with yours? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, um, I guess I am now. <laughs> well, carry on if you have more to say. Well, Thank you. Pitch in whenever. Um, this was a de deconstructed part of the Chicago. This, I think, is absolutely exquisite. Well, one of the things we need to, do need to point out is that it, she's made this garment. Aside from the embellishments, she has constructed the garment like the instructions of the Chicago jacket. Right. So it has a little patch on the inside that is a stabilizing piece for the button and the buttonhole. She's made the double turned narrow hem for all of the hems. The pocket is on the inside of this jacket. So all of this is, aside from making the fabric, this is just like the pattern. Right. Now, I should say that these patches were applied before the garments constructed. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I thought what struck me about this garment, and I hadn't seen this garment until the other day, was a, a year or so ago, I wanted to make something sort of like this. I had it in my mind, and one of my inspirational artists is named Holly Badgley. And Holly Badgley is an artist in Sausalito, California, and she actually does printed, silk screened type designs, but they're, they have patchwork like elements to it. So I was going to sort of make, this was my inspiration photo that I cut out and put in my journal. Well, and I decided to make it Chicago jacket, and I made some copies of the technicals that are included in the guide sheet. And you, if you have a copy machine, you can take those and blow them up. And then you have an outline surface that you could begin to draw on. So you can see here, I've traced those technicals and then put some designs here and there, very similar to what Kathy was doing. But one thing led to another, and I didn't end up with that at all. Yeah, but see, I think this is just, for someone who wants to do a little bit of piecing, that, those pictures are beautiful. But it gives you a sense of balance before you are working mm -hmm. big. On the, but, so I began to cut things out, thinking I was going to do this. But as I began to cut things out, I would lay the sections on the floor. Or if I had a quilt wall or something like that, I would have put them up. But I started taking pictures of my pieces and parts. And all of a sudden, I realized that I wasn't a raw edge girl at all at that point, that I wanted this to be a more finished, programmed garment. So I took the elements, the pocket, the little tab for the uh, 
button and I put them on the outside of the garment. So I used the exact pocket piece and applied it to the outside. Two different denims. I put the patches on the outside. So I didn't have to really think about shapes. Those shapes were there for me in the pattern. So again, it's constructed similarly to the guide sheet, but everything's brought to the outside. I started using shirtings, woven stripes that I had scraps of. These are cotton and linen and things that I had on hand. And I made this sewn on, sewn together series of stripes or bindings to the front. Now one of the, thing, one of the things I want to encourage you to do is I want you to work out, think about working out all of your issues, your engineering issues, prior to really getting started. So there happens to be a detail right here that's a little fussy. This little hem that comes out of the seam that inserts into the collar. You have to nail that. And I was doing that with this added band where normally it's just the whole continuation of the front. So I began to do some samples of how was I going to make this particular band. Was I going to sew it to the back and bring it to the front and top stitch it? Or was I going to attach it to the front and take it to the back side? Or was it going to be an extension to the front? I wanted to know what I was dealing with in terms of thickness and the sewing. And you can see I determined that I sewed it to the front and, and wrapped it to the back even though now that I look at this, I kind of like the other idea, but that's what I decided at the time. Um, and I worked out this corner, how to do this corner right away. So I knew what I was into and knew that if I couldn't tackle this and make this look good, I was going to move on or do something else and not, not go there. But I had it all worked out ahead of time so that I could have fun sewing the garment. I also decided to do some top stitching. And so this jacket has a lot of top stitching on it. And I began to experiment. Here are all my samples of top stitching. Stitch length, type of thread, needle to use, presser foot to use, sewing from the right side, sewing from the wrong side. Here are all my samples of getting those details worked out. At the same time, I'm making a list of the order of construction because it varied just a little bit from the original guide sheet. So this is my, my guide sheet of how I, the order in which I was going to do things. So let's talk about top stitching. Do you do a lot of top stitching? Not so much. I Not think. so much. This, but every time I see this jacket, it's always one of my favorite ones. It's just beautiful. Well, the top stitching is through a variety of thicknesses here. This garment has a seam here, a seam here, but this is a dart. And this is just the top stitching line that continues from the seam. So it's a really interesting construction. There's no true side seam to this garment, but this is all like a little puzzle that goes together and it's really a, a very unique construction. So I wanted my top stitching to be perfect. So I decided to, I landed on the idea of using dual duty heavy thread. This is a, a 30 weight thread, buttonhole twist basically is what this is. And you can buy this anywhere in a lot of different colors. I experimented with a lot of needles and I ended up, believe it or not, with a 90 embroidery needle. Not a top stitching needle, right. not a leather needle, not a sharp. I had all of them and I tried all of them. It, in this book, but the one that produced the best stitch was the embroidery needle. So you never know what needle is going to work for your machine, your thread, your condition, your fabric, whatever. You have to be willing to change and play and figure it out. The stitch length that I liked best was four millimeters long, so a little bit longer. I used a walking foot or even feed feature. I tested stitching on both the right side and the wrong side because I figured they, I would see the thread here and there on the right and wrong side. 
didn't show up too much like that, but I, I wanted to make sure that my stitch looked even and balanced on the top side and the bobbin side. So I do have the same thread in both the top and the bottom, which is not necessarily always the case. I did interface in a couple of places to give it some stability because this fabric is thin along the pocket. So a little bit of interfacing here and there just to stabilize a few things. If you're making a buttonhole, I don't know what you, kind of buttonhole you made here. Is it just a regular buttonhole? It's a machine. Machine buttonhole. One of the buttonhole features you might have on your machine is a keyhole button. Oh, I... and, and you might think about that on a jacket that's a little bit heavier, the keyhole that has the little circle at one end. I think that's a pretty buttonhole. I think it's beautiful. I didn't do it either, but you could. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have it. <laughs> so I added a yoke to mine, an inner interior yoke. But basically, it's the sta uh, Chicago jacket, elements on the outside. I added some fabric for a turned back sleeve facing, which the pattern does not have. So you lengthened your sleeve. I did. To turn it back. Yes. Okay. And I have a seam here at the bottom and a facing that goes about six inches into oh, the sleeve yeah. so that when it turns up, that's pretty. it's finished. And then the under collar, like yours, isn't your under collar different or is it the same? Yeah, it's different. Yours is the denim on the inside, mine's the stripe on the inside, so I contrasted right. the, uh, the collar. So those are our Chicago jackets that we're just terribly proud of. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. We couldn't say more about them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, we do have a couple of other garments that I think require some thinking about the top stitching. And one is the Stafford jacket. You want to hold that a minute? Mm -hmm. So this is our Stafford jacket. This is our interpretation of a jeans jacket. You know, there are lots of patterns out there for jean jackets, and I wanted something a little bit different. So this has a shorter, broader sleeve with this double wide uh, top stitched hem. Lots of top stitching all over this. Using, again, the same thread. Uh, the back has a little bit of easing across here. So this is a perfect jacket for this fall if you don't want the longer versions, such as a Chicago jacket. It's just a great throw-on piece. I noticed Erin today had on a uh, jean jacket when she came in. Um, now she doesn't because it's warmed up in here a little bit. But it's, it's just that kind of jacket you just throw And you, on. you could even mix your denims a little. That's right. You Although could. I think this is beautiful all in one. And with the orange gold top stitching. You can get this top stitching in red and gold and white and really all kinds of colors. Um, the one thing I wanted to tell you that we have that this jacket asks for is snaps. And snaps are a little bit hard to find. So we have a lot of great snaps. We have big snaps in this off-white ivory, in the gunmetal, large size. And then the smaller size, we have a little tortoise snap. And we have it in polished, antique, gold, and gunmetal. What do you have on here? I have the uh, black none of those. One. OK. It's That's a black it. one, it's this. It's this one, but a little bit smaller. Right. But you know what? I don't believe we had these snaps when I made that. So I bought, those aren't very good looking snaps now that I look at it. <laughs> Sorry. Sure. So the ivory. Up higher. Yeah, all right. Up higher, I'm being told here. <laughs> Hold on. So we have the ivory, gun metal in the large, tortoise in a smaller size. polished chrome or nickel, antique brass, and a gunmetal in the smaller sizes. So we have snaps for you if you're interested. All right, let's talk about the getaway jeans a minute, too. Um, the getaway jeans is another pattern of ours that we like to use in denim. And again, this is showing the top stitching, very prominent top stitching. This is a dart that is not a fitting dart. It's simply a detail. So don't think that this is something that's going to help, help your uh, uh, 
fitting. It's just simply an, a, a clever little detail. There's lots of top stitching on this. You can see here, this one is in red top stitching. And this one's in the gold. The nice thing about our getaway jeans is they have the jeans look in the front, but they are a better fitting jean in the back because of the elastic on the yoke. All right, so let's talk about fabrics a little bit. We have a lot of denims. Um, we have the traditional denim, heavyweight denim, that is, why don't you hold that one. You can see this is clearly denim because it's blue on one side and the white filling thread on the other side. So you hold that. It has some body to it. Has it has some body. Would make any of the jackets. We have the very same denim in a black denim. That's pretty. But that white filling comes through, so you have that classic denim look. You can just throw those down over there. <laughs> so here's another slightly lighter weight denim in a more mid blue cotton and this has that fiber called reprieve in it we've talked about that before do you know what reprieve is i don't well reprieve is the sustainable fiber that's made out of recycled plastic bottles oh, okay. and we're seeing it more and more in garment fabrics because the the whole textile world is really becoming quite interested in the sustainability factor of things and so that has repeat uh, reprieve and cotton and lycra there's there's a nice stretch to yeah, this. It's only two percent lycra, but it's it's enough. It's nice, and it's a great color. It's a great weight. Nice, yeah. It's a nice has a little bit of drape to it. Yeah, you could choose. All of these will be on the uh, website. Uh, how do we do that, Erin? Again, I can't remember. Um, under shop, and then Linda's videos, and then there'll be a category for the denim. All right, video. under shop on our website, under Linda's videos, then there's a link to the fabrics that we're talking about today. All right, uh, we have another even lighter color. Uh, this has a little polyester in it. So this is even drapier and a little bit lighter weight yet. So with, you, with stretch. With stretch, that's right. So that's more of a light indigo. Then we have, and the reason I had this pair of getaways out is I made these getaways in a fabric that has a lot of stretch, tons of stretch. And we have that fabric in the dark blue, cotton and polyester and spandex, very deep blue, rich blue. And it doesn't have soft. Yeah, it's very soft, very comfortable denim. And we also have it in this deep olive color. Okay, so here's the stretch. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, that's a nice, nice stretch for a denim. So we go from the ones that don't have stretch to a little bit of stretch to more stretch from cotton, cotton polyester, cotton and reprieve, all cotton. We have lots of varieties. Now I get the Wall Street Journal, as you know, and I follow other high-end sites, and I've been getting a lot of emails and texts and promotions about this color for this season. So even though you might think of the off-white or cream as a summer color, this is what we're seeing for fall. A jacket in cream with maybe taupe or camel with it, maybe a camel sweatshirt underneath, or camel pants. You could put it with white, white. So you mix all your neutrals, but this off-white is still good for right now. And of course, if you live in certain places, you can wear this color year round more than perhaps we think we can in Kansas. I'm still of the school where, you know, we put our white shoes away on Labor Day, but my daughter thinks I'm completely old fashioned and I think she's right. So I have been trying to wear my white shoes even though Labor Day is long gone. This so, has kind of an oyster color. Yeah, to this it. is a really nice denim. Pretty, yes. It's a great weight 
and some drape has some spandex in it. It's nice. It is. And then we have four kind of novelty fabrics that fall into the category of, they're not exactly denim, but they certainly are great fabrics to use for these kinds of jackets. So this one is a more tropical We have weight. our so, animals upside yeah, down. Yeah, we've got our animals upside down. Sorry about that. Our cheetahs are, are standing on their heads. But uh, I think this would make a great Stafford or... I do, too. Or um, Chica Chicago. Well, Either one. Yeah, you do have to pay attention that the wrong side of your fabric will show just right up here on the lapel That's of the right. Chicago. So if that would bother you, that this white would show on the back side, this really wouldn't bother me too much. But you could face right. the front of the Chicago right. jacket if you wanted to. Yes. So we have this one. We have a fabric that looks very much like denim, but it's not an actual denim construction. But it is a really great sort of uh, resist dyed looking fabric. Is it cotton? Cotton and lycra has stretch. Yeah. Make a great jacket. I, I think it's beautiful. Yeah. Kathy's used this fabric in a jacket, which we'll sh we're going to show not this session, but later on. This is actually linen, but boy, what a great jacket this would be. And you have this in another color, too. We have it right here silver. that we're going to hold up. This is great. I, I've washed it. I mean, it's great as it is now, but if you want it to soften up a bit, it goes through the wash and dryer. Great. Yeah. Brianna, who works for us out of Lawrence, Kansas, has made a pair of Hollywood pants out of this oh and posted gosh. it on her Instagram account. That They're would be really, beautiful. really cute. Yeah. And the same fabric in gray. Oh, that we talked about. It looks like a brush print, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it does. So, sponge, brushed, great jacket fabric. Right. All right. So, we have some things on sale, of course. For printed patterns, we have the Chicago jacket, the Stafford jacket, and the getaway jeans patterns. Those three patterns are on sale this week for $18. The Getaway and the Stafford are also digital download patterns, not the Chicago, but the other two, and they are $15. We have a tutorial. If you're interested in making a jacket pretty much like this, there's a tutorial called Denim Chicago, and it'll take you step by step through the process of making this jacket, and that's $15. All of our snaps are 20% off. And all of the denims and the fabrics that we've shown here are also 20% off for another through next Monday. Do you have any questions? We do. All right. Okay, um, Kathy, for your jacket, um, we had questions about what channel stitching is. Oh, channel stitching is just straight up and down next to each other. You're just doing a straight stitch using the width of your presser foot for your next one he here. Parallel lines of sewing. Yes. Isn't that channel stitching? Yes, it is. <laughs> Since I named it. It is. <laughs> and then um, when you were putting the kimono fabrics on there, did you have just one large piece of fabric or did you have your, um, like your front and Repeat your back, the question. Um, all cut out? Oh, I cut each piece out of the garment and then apply and then worked with each piece. Like the sleeve was flat, one piece and I put it on there, the front. So you had two fronts, a back, two sleeves, and a collar, and each one of those were embellished and stitched before she assembled the garment. Right, yes. And could you hold up your jacket and bring it closer to the camera so they can see it a little more? How, how close do we get? Okay, that's good. All right, the bottom. Yeah, show the stitching. Can you see the, you can probably see the channel stitching on this piece here, on the lighter piece. You can see it really well at the top by the shoulder. Right here. Mm -hmm. There's some uh, kimono pieces that do have a selvage edge. And when I would find ones to do that, I would use it like this. It will not ravel down because that's the selvage of it. If I could use that edge on a lot of the kimono pieces I did. Kimono pieces are only 14 inches wide, true kimono pieces. 
So that sort of helps, in a way, uh, limit. You don't have these vast quantities of yardage to deal with. You can visualize them a little bit smaller. But cutting on the bias, which I really didn't do here, but is a great way to uh, kind of inhibit some of the raveling also. You're just, it's going to be harder to use your pieces. You're going to use more fabric than you want, but it would be a really great. Not all kimono pieces are silk. We're seeing more polyester, rayons, and so forth, mixed fibers of kimonos. You can also back them with a very, very sheer interfacing, and that inhibits the raveling as well. Mm -hmm. All right, um, on your jacket, uh, Linda, can you show, they wanted to see the back of it and also the interior with the yoke, <clears throat> the contrasting fabric. All right. Get rid of this. So I just simply stitched a yoke to the inside. I did that really for looks. The jacket doesn't need it, although in certain fabrics, it is a stabilizing factor in a jacket. It's, you know, a shoulder, a back stay, it's called. Isn't that the term for in the tailoring for a, I think it is, a back stay or something like that. So I really did it for looks. And what was the other thing they wanted to see? Uh, show the back of the garment. The, the back of the garment. Anything going on in the back? Nothing Not really going problem. on in the back. <laughs> Can you oh. shorten or um, talk about the lengthening of the Chicago? We have lengthened and shortened lines on the Chicago jacket pattern. And whenever you're uh, sh lengthening or shortening something that is asymmetric, as this is, you have to blend the lines from the bottom to the top. So you're connecting from the top to the bottom, bottom to the top and you're just ignoring what's happening in between in terms of the shifting. And if it has a curve, you're going to emulate the same curve. If it's straight, it's going to be a straight line. But we do have length and the short lines on the pattern. And how much now, uh, that brings up another point, the lengthening. Kathy lengthened her jacket two inches. Did you do it on the bottom? Or where did you do it? I did it like you do. Okay. I mean, yes. You split the pattern. Uh-huh. Okay. This is a, it's possible with certain figures, you could lengthen this along the bottom. But it does peg a little bit, so you have to be careful about that. The other thing I, I've noticed, I've made one very long, a Chicago jacket, oh, yeah. ankle length. And I realized that it split when I walked. So Sandra Betsina has this famous technique called adding walking ease. So you actually add a wedge to the front of the jacket at the center front, so it's wider at the bottom than it is at the top, and that then makes the garment look like it's hanging straight, even though it's a little bit wedged. Now, I do that on my jackets. Do you? And I just actually redraw the, set, the front line, and I'll come out one inch at the bottom, and then put it back up to the normal uh, front cutting line. So it's just a big line that comes out yeah. here. But it doesn't, you don't see that when the garment's finished, but it doesn't split wide open when you're wearing it. So and you could um, lengthen it substantially, like how many? I've lengthened this to the ankle. I've made this a, in fact, last, in last week's... Samantha had it on last week. Yes, in last week's video, we paired it with something, and it, it's a very long Ponte knit Chicago coat. So you can go, Inch, I, th I don't remember the number of inches, but it was 20, 25 inches at least, probably. You're sitting yeah. down. And you can shorten it as well. And you can shorten it as well. I think shortening it is a little bit more problematic because of this, the interface and interconnection of these. I think shortening is going to uh, take some work. One thing to consider is there are bust starts right here. Instead of coming out of a, of a side seam or an arm's eye seam, there's a bust start right here. Did you put the bust start in your, yes, you did. I did. I have left it out sometimes if I had a heavy, heavy, heavy um, fabric. Yeah. But, but you want to be able to move this up or down. This is a bust start, so put that in the right place. Um, would you, on these patterns, could you use laminated linen or wool melting? 
On these patterns, could you use laminated linen or wool melton? Absolutely. This could be a raincoat, laminated linen, wool melton, no problem. I would consider perhaps doing overlapping seams in the wool melton. Maybe. It depends on the raveling aspect of your wool melton. Um, but because it, it would be pretty thick through here with all these things coming together. You'd have to take a look at that. Make a sample <laughs> and see what happens. But yes, it'd be beautiful in wool melting. Um, and Kathy, the jacket you're making, how did you do the sleeves? Oh, this? Mm -hmm. The one I have right. on? Right. Okay. Um, early before I put it away in the unfinished box, I, this is just pieced, cut, pieced, and like quilting, like the wild quilting. And it was on the back of the jacket that I had made, and I couldn't throw it away, and I had to incorporate it in here. So there was just enough to balance it out with. Um, so this is just pretty much traditional quilting pieces. Just crazy. These are little stripes that have been reversed. Here you have your squares cut on the diagonal, so it looks like sort of half prairie points. And it probably was pieced and then cut up and re-pieced like many of the quilters do. I don't know, you know, sometimes when you look at things that you did before, I thought, oh my gosh, I really did a great job piecing this. <laughs> so I had to use it. Yeah, it's but great. Um, to cover up all the, I did line this part of the sleeve with a purple lining fabric because all the seams were showing on, on the quilting, so. Uh, a couple of remarks about the Stafford. Um, if you could show more close-ups of the Stafford um, in the back as well. And then also, how would you lengthen and narrow the sleeve? Okay. Uh, this is the Stafford close-up. So you have the western pocket flap with the traditional western style insertions here. Snaps for the closure. This has a two piece collar. I don't know that you can see it here, but it has a partial stand just through the back, which makes this collar really stand up nice. I love that feature. Yeah. But it only comes around to here. So narrowing the sleeve is a matter of determining the circumference that you want. Take a tape measure, put it around your arm, decide if you want 10 inches, 15 inches, whatever you want. And then you would simply go from underarm to that new point. Yeah, hold that. You would still use the same point here, but you're going to draw a new line that would be narrower. The back of it has the easing right below the yoke. And the bottom has a double row of stitching. Um, with all the talk about lengthening, um, they want to know how tall you are. <laughs> Kathy is 5'7 and I'm 5'6. Is that about right? Probably. Yeah. Some people get nervous about lengthening and, um, and kind of knowing how long to make things. And, yeah. Um, I don't, people get nervous about lengthening is what I'm hearing. Um, you know, I do a lot of standing in front of a mirror with a garment pinned or a piece pinned or a tissue pattern pinned, or I'm measuring a garment that's in my closet to see what I like. Tape measure, standing in front of the mirror, you know, you just have to experiment. There's a proportion thing that goes on if you're wearing something that has volume on the top, maybe things are a little bit slimmer on the bottom, vice versa. If you have a full pant, then maybe what you wear on top is a little bit shorter, maybe a little more fitted. I think probably the patterns are kind of scaled to maybe five 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 six what five six i think is pretty much yeah yeah i i figured if i own a pattern collection i want them to fit me yeah. <laughs> so they're pretty much built for a five six person right okay um the only other question was actually about serging not off topic but um, um oh, a couple other questions anyways um three thread or four thread serging the question is about serging I'm not sure the condition we're talking about, but do I use three thread or four thread? I use three thread serging 99% of the time as a finishing stitch. That is what I use for the edge to finish the edges, whether it's a single layer or I've sewn the seam and I'm serging two layers together. 
The only time I use four thread serging is if I'm making yoga pants, which I never do, swimsuits, which I never do, children's clothes, which I never do. I don't think I've ever used it. Four thread is not really a factor in my life. And what size are those Chicago jackets? These Chicago jackets are, this is a me, small, I think they're smalls. You had on a small. This is a small. This is a small. Yeah. I don't know what that is. I think this is a small. I I'm do not too. Sure. I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, we do have one more. Sorry. Do you soften the denim before sewing? Do you soften the denim before sewing? I would. I would throw it in the washing machine. Get, get out some of the, sometimes these denims have a little excess dye in them and you want to get rid of some of the color just to make sure. And yes, you can soften them. Some soften, some don't. But we always recommend that you at least put in a four inch square fabric from the corner, throw it in the washing machine and see what happens. But I suggest that you pre-wash the denims. I do too. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. We'll be back next week. Thank you, Kathy, for Thanks. joining. It's Thanks. fun as always. Thanks. <laughs> Bye.